Well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Doug Shipman. I'm the director of Windsor Historical Society. I'd like to welcome you to this evening's virtual program. And uh, this evening's program, we're really big on alliteration here. So it's Titles, Trees, and Towns, Windsor and its Western Lands with our guest speaker, Al Beam. And uh, thanks all for joining us tonight. Uh, this is our first virtual history program of this winter season. It will be presented in two parts tonight and then the same time next Thursday evening. So we hope you can join us for both programs. Uh, shortly, I'll introduce Al, and he's got a lot to share with you tonight. Um, but as it's been a little while since some people have done Zoom, we all thought we were done with Zoom for a while, and now we're back to Zoom again. Uh, I want to quickly mention a few tips that may enable you to enjoy the virtual program as fully as possible. So first, you should be aware that uh, you've all been put on mute uh, when you entered the program. This is just so that nobody's background noise or competing audio systems interfere with other people's enjoyment. Uh, please remain muted throughout the program until it's time for you to ask questions or make comments uh, later in the program. When it is time to talk, you can use the space bar or unmute yourself uh, or click the un unmute box in the uh, upper right corner of your picture to unmute yourself to talk. And then please remember to mute yourself after you finish your question. In order to view the presentation most fully on your screen, you might like to select the speaker view option in the upper right corner of your screen. This will expand the image of the speaker and minimize other images so you can see the full program as clearly as possible. Al will be using the uh, screen share feature. He has some really detailed PowerPoint slides to share that you may find very interesting. So you'll wanna see them as largely as possible on your screen. Uh, we wanna make this program as interactive uh, as possible and as close to live as we can given the situation. Uh, Al will begin his presentation and then pause periodically uh, to open it up for your questions and comments. Uh, we do hope you'll have plenty of questions for him and we'll provide a chance for you to ask questions at the end during the question and answer session as well. So please save your questions or remarks for those specific parts of the program. When it's time to ask your questions, you can just raise your hand on your screen and wave it <laughs> or use the raise hand function uh, that's built into Zoom. Uh, or if you just want to type questions into the chat box, um, I'll try to capture those and, and read those to Al as well. Finally, as you may have noticed when you entered, we are recording this program, uh, which will include audio and video recording of the presentation uh, and the Q&A portion. Uh, this is so we can share it with other people later on. Al's uh, had many requests for people to see this presentation uh, afterwards, and they couldn't join us tonight, so we want to capture the whole thing. If you'd prefer not to have your image appear on the video, uh, you can click the video icon on the bottom left of your screen and, and stop your video feed. Um, of course, we like to see your faces because then Al knows that you're all paying attention and not out getting another drink in the kitchen or something like that. Right? <laughs> so uh, we are so pleased to have with us tonight Al Beam. This is not his first rodeo here with the Historical Society, as, as many of you probably know. Um, he's a longtime member and supporter of the Windsor Historical Society. Um, Al hails from Kensington, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. He holds two degrees in mechanical engineering and has worked for 45 years in the manned space program at Hamilton Standard, which is now the Collins Aerospace Division of Raytheon Corporation. Al has long held an interest in historical research, which he shares with both his mother and his brother, and it was always a big part of their conversations in his house growing up as a kid. Uh, his interest in Windsor history started uh, while illustrating the front covers for the Exchange Club's local phone book for 12 years, uh, where he researched the history of each of the buildings that he depicted. Uh, in celebration of uh, Windsor's 375th anniversary, um, uh, the founding of the Plymouth Trading Post here in Windsor, he found the story to be more than just a painting. And he created his first program for the Windsor Historical Society back then, uh, especially after finding out that his wife, Marilyn, was a direct descendant of Jonathan Brewster, the second captain of the trading post back in 1634. So today is Al's fourth program uh, for Windsor Historical Society. I know you will find it as interesting as we did. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Al Beam 
And I'm going to uh, open up the slides uh, and go to the screen share mode so you can see those as well. Hopefully everybody can see that and it should be full screen and okay. uh, it's all yours. Okay. I, I call this program the Dominion of New England. I never heard that term before and it is directly connected to um, the Charter Oak incident. And, and it ultimately comes down to what I call Connecticut's Western lands because Windsor and Hartford benefited greatly um, by the uh, Charter Oak incident. Next. Um, so this chapter one is gonna be the events leading up to the Charter Oak incident. You're gonna see the, there's some friction between the colony and English royalty, how Hartford and Windsor shared this land-based windfall. Um, Next week, we'll talk about the land they got and how it was distributed between the two towns. And once distributed, how each town was gonna to parcel out to their individual taxpayers. And so we will look next week specifically at Torrington and Bark Hampstead. And uh, we'll talk a very, very briefly at the end on the westward migra migration of an overpopulated uh, colony of Connecticut. Okay, next. Uh, I got interested in this because I had put together a, just a small program on how Windsor got its shape. And um, all the towns to the right um, is what I considered Windsor's colonial time. And I was really surprised that the next, next slide, um, the next button, I just, how are these towns connected to um, daughter towns of Windsor? This, this uh, drawing came from uh, the Windsor Historical Society's 375th booklet. So next. Um, this is just the resources I used mostly for this presentation. Uh, a book in the uh, Windsor Historical Society's library, the daughter towns of Windsor and the history of Litchfield County. And in the bottom right, the public records of the colony of Connecticut. Um, especially this book is the years that's called the administration of Sir Edmund Andros. That's a name I had never come across, but he plays a large role in this, in this uh, program. And then other resources were uh, from the internet. Okay, next. So when we look at Connecticut, which is known as you know, the, the colony of steady habits, um, the way they would start a town was you had 12 to 15 families, you could petition the general court for an ecclesiastical society, which would be a congregational church. And next. And the first group to break off from us were Simsbury and, and keep going, click, click a couple times here. And so these areas were purchased and um, keep going till it's full. Uh, and these were going one by one and every one of these towns was started by the steady habit of first ecclesiastical society. And um, then next, one more next, Click. Um, when you've got a when the 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 community has grown to a little larger size, you get to uh, petition the general court to, for an independent township, and so that's the way. What I consider the daughter towns to have um, come to be. Uh, next, uh, the western towns follow a completely different path. And that's what we're gonna be talking tonight about. So we'll get, a, here's a kind of a timeline of this story kind of covers the 1600s, the 17th century. 
and it starts the upper part starts to what was going on in England. The bottom part was what was going on in America. So in 1603, uh, Elizabeth I uh, dies and it's the end of the Tudors. And James one and six, somehow the six is missing, um, come into power. He is about 35 years old. He's been King of Scotland for 34 years. He was coronated on his first birthday. Um, and as he is coming uh, from Scotland on a small caravan, it keeps getting larger and larger. Uh, two Puritan um, ministers pre present him with a, um, a petition to consider the Puritanism over the Anglican Church of England that uh, Henry VIII started. And uh, there's also a big faction at that time of Catholics in England. Um, and so we know James won for his Bible, but what was surprising was that before he even got near London, he was presented with a thousand signatures on this petition from Puritan ministers. What you have to realize is there's only about, I don't know, today there's only a little over a thousand towns and cities in England. So the Puritan movement had spread through the whole country. It just a lot sooner than I was aware. It wasn't just a little group that you know started Plymouth Plantation. So as we get to 1625, James dies, uh, his son Charles the first takes over. And five years later, we see down below, there's a Jamestown colony, there's a Plymouth Plantation colony. And in 1630 to 1640 is an area as a term a timeline that was considered the Great Migration, mostly of Puritans coming into Massachusetts Bay. And we know in 1635, Massachusetts Bay in the Boston area was, you know, just too many people. And the towns of uh, Windsor, Hartford, and Wethersfield were established. So 1640, the migration stopped because the Protestants got together and said, we want a revolution. And so there was a civil war that pretty much in, was five years long um, and Oliver Cromwell took over and England no longer had a king or queen and it was um, a republic. And that worked until uh, Oliver Cromwell died and his son turned out not to be a good administrator and the parliament invited back um, Charles' first son, Charles II, um, to become king and, and, and the kings returned to England. So this is the return of the kings. And uh, one more click. And you'll see that's what we're going to discuss tonight and starting in 1660. Um, and right away, as soon as that happens, Connecticut decides, whoa, we need to better get a charter here. And uh, so our governor, colonial governor, um, he goes to, uh, goes to London. And we have about 25 years before we'll get to the Charter Rope incident. Okay, next. So 1660, the Republic fails. Here comes uh, Charles II. And of course, the first thing he does is gonna, he's going to uh, get a shovel and dig up Oliver Cromwell's body from Westminster Abbey and have a public hanging, a beheading, and puts Oliver Cromwell's head on a stake. After 20 years, it, uh, it's in front of some town gate and um, uh, lightning hits it and no one today knows where Oliver Cromwell's remains are. So, Maybe um, Connecticut, though, oh. goes to get a new charter. I was trying to go to the hospital now, but. Is there an issue? Sound? Um, next slide. So in 1662, our governor was John Withrop Jr. Jr. His father was the governor of the Massachusetts Bay. And over there, there's Lord Say and Seal and Lord Brooke. Um, 
who join him. They really are the Say and Brook of Saybrook. Uh, they never left London, but they were, that was their community. They had a patent for that. And um, they negotiate with Charles II. And he treats the colony uh, as an English corporation. He allows them to have a governor and a company of, um, and he names us in his in the document, the gov governor and company of the English colony of Connecticut in New England in America. I was amazed that this started really early. All those words are still in our vocabulary. Um, the shareholders in this company are the free men of the colony. And when they say men, they really mean men. Um, and indentured servants would not be one of them until they got done their whatever their, their duty was. Uh, and then they would become free men. And also it recognized the governor, a deputy governor and 12 assistants elected annually. Okay, next. And, um, and their general assembly was called the general court. Um, and they basically got all the legislative and judicial powers. And in each town could elect no more than two members annually to be on the general court. And the General Assembly or General Court could make no laws contrary to those of England. And so that was a pretty good deal. Next. And so what does Charles II extract for Connecticut for Judge General Liberties? Uh, hit it twice, please. States the king shall receive one fifth or 20% of all the gold and silver mind in the colony. And I thought that was a pretty amazing good deal until my sister calls me up and she's doing a genealogical thing on an aunt who had been committed to the uh, Middletown uh, Mental Hospital and had passed away and said she wanted me to go. They finally put a big plaque up of all the people buried there to see what year that had happened. And where did she send me? Next slide. Sent me to Silver Mine Road. And I was really, really shocked. And so I had to look up silver mines and found out that Connecticut actually had 21 silver mines. But in reality, they were lead mines with a very small percentage of silver and extra. And they really were very active um, in our wars because lead lead bullets and, and, uh, and shells were needed. So um, next slide. Okay, um, now wh what was the land grant that came with our charter? Well, next slide, I hit the button. It started from Narragansett Bay and um, Narragansett Bay was named twice. Narragansett River was named once. And that was the east boundary. And it extended to the South Sea right along a parallel meridians that go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And that was our land grant. Pretty good deal, pretty sweet deal. And so this would be one break point of the charter. Um, Does, uh, are there any questions of, so far? We lost anybody? <laughs> anybody has a, a question, please feel free to raise your hand and, and wave it back and forth. I'll, uh, we'll try to call on you if we can see you. I don't, uh, don't see anybody. Okay, well, so, <laughs> Rhode Island knew that we had gotten a charter in 1662. So the very next year, they went to visit the king. And next slide. And they've got where Plymouth Colony stopped, but they went and had land on 
to the Pawcatuck River. So next slide. And so the mouth of the Pawcatuck is kind of today's um, state line for Connecticut and Rhode Island, but the headwaters is what the, their charter said, and that was way, way eastward. And so that's where Connecticut says, no, we got to, you might have this charter that overlaps, but not as much as you think. It will take 180 years for Connecticut and Rhode Island to establish the boundary that exists today. And it just was amazing how Oh, the king intentionally making overlaps, but we'll go on to the next year. Um, and so I need a next slide. So the next year, Charles Grant's his brother, uh, James, uh, who came back from Europe, but they were in exile while the Republic existed. And he gives him the title of the Duke of York and he grants him a, a a patent, they always call that, a, you know, whatever the, the, the piece of paper was uh, for the colony of New York. So next. So it starts at the Delaware River at the bottom of New Jersey. And now the next one, we'll see how it spreads out and, and it spreads all the way to the Connecticut River and essentially into the headwaters of the Connecticut River. So that creates now a, a really a, a problem for Connecticut because um, the next slide, the next slide, this is the, the pink uh, or the reddish um, rectangle is the official, the, the first um, deeded uh, land the treaty we made with the Native Americans of the Connecticut River Valley. And then the boundary, the red lines are what was purchased after that, that became those first 10 towns that were on the, the like the second slide. Um, but where do the people live at this time? So we'll go to the next slide. And, and what I want you to pay attention to is, this is 1670 and 1630 is Windsor, and you and I, remember how I said that to start an ecclesiastical society, uh, you needed 12 to 15 families. Well, the first town to have the next ecclesiastical society was um, 26 years later in East Windsor. That everybody in the colony in 1670 was living on the west side of the river that had just been deeded also to the king's brother, James. So there's definitely a controversy that's gonna to come to fruition uh, as we get into the, the, this discussion. Uh, next. Now, what's the Duke of York's problem? Well, problem number one is the Dutch own and occupy New York. They call it New Amsterdam. Problem number two, the Delaware River uh, is colonized by Sweden. So um, the first thing that they do is he outfits uh, four frigates with 300 uh, uh, Marines and they sail to the New World uh, without, with, without James though. Okay, next slide. And so in 1664, um, the British fleet, four frigates, 300 soldiers, and then privateers were a big thing. They were, they were pirates, essentially, who though were, who flew under the flag of different uh, countries, and, and they could do legal sacking. And so they're out in the harbor. Uh, Peter Syverson does not want to surrender New York to, these, uh, to England, um, you know, even though they were just across the North Sea, um, Holland and, and uh, England didn't get along all that well, had many wars, and he's ready to fire on them. Um, and fortunately, two ministers go up because the militia will not go and defend the city. And if he fires one cannon shot, the pirate privateers have the right to sack the city. And that would not be a pretty sight. And these two ministers talk, Peter Stuyvesant 
down and it's named New York. So, so next. And so this is a, we're not gonna go over the details of this map, but this map, um, I think I got out of, uh, can't remember where I got it, but essentially all the little arrows are talk about the overlaps of all the land grants made by King Charles II. You can see that Virginia is on the other side of the Great Lakes claiming that land. New York claims what's Kentucky, uh, parts of Ohio. Everybody has overlapping grants. And the first thing that will happen after the revolution and the, the um, Confederacy of States that we had, um, every state, essentially everything was 18, uh, six, I mean, sorry, 1783, um, we started resolving all the boundaries, all except the Connecticut, Rhode Island, which would take a, another many years to resolve. So just, it was just crazy. I guess Charles II was not a cartographer because this was a horrible mess between all of the colonies of where their boundaries actually were. So next. And so uh, now that James, uh, Duke of York had New, had New York, um, he assigned uh, governors to run it. The residents had no representation. This was strictly a colonial governor assigned by the king. So England, I mean, so Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts, I'm not sure about Massachusetts, but Rhode Island and Connecticut definitely had the first democracies probably in the world. Well, no, we maybe go back a long time to Greece, but um, for the new world, we were the two democratic uh, colonies. Um, and so in 1674, the third uh, governor is a man named Edmund Andros, and he will claim all non-deeded land west of the Connecticut River for the Duke of York. English owner, landowners um, were not affected by this degree, decree. Uh, you know, they could keep their land. They had been given the land by the king, supposedly, and therefore they were free. But if the Holland people, uh, the, um, they, they could stay on their land, but they were gonna have to uh, pay the king uh, King's Ransom, I guess you could call it, to stay on the land that they had been given by the uh, New Amsterdam uh, government. So next. So, the, so uh, Andros, in um, the next year, 1675, he sails to Saybrook Fort with a military force, and his intentions are to claim jurisdiction over Western territory, including Windsor. But again, it's for the undeeded land. He is met by Captain Bull and a militia, I'm not sure from which community, who forbade him from even getting off the boat and reading the proclamation. But so frustrated, Andrew saves off, sails off to Long Island and no one knows what happened to him next. But Connecticut is definitely forewarned of the Crown's intention. So now let's step forward again and one more slide. And 10 years go by and everything is good, but 10 years later, James II ascends to the throne. Uh, he's no longer the Duke of York, he's King James II. His brother had died the year before. And interestingly, uh, his brother in his last five years uh, tried to change um, and open England up to the Catholics. Catholics at that time were, were um, could not hold any government jobs. Um, and uh, they were going to soften that. And, uh, and what, um, so what Charles did to stop it is he dismissed the parliament. Every time the parliament, he made, would make a rule the parliament would, would gather to um, override it and he would dismiss um, the parliament. That's a right of kings that exists 
today. Queen Elizabeth, one of her one of her powers is she could dismiss Parliament at any time. She never has. Most of the 20th century and 19th century uh, kings did not. But um, and they also in 1684 he revoked um, the Massachusetts Bay Charter. He claimed the violations were that the colonist Mass Bay colon, colony was trading with other nations uh, despite the Navigation Act prohibiting from doing that. Um, the colony also ran an illegal mint that made coins without the king's image on them. Uh, that one was, uh, I, that was kind of a good laugh. And then the general court created a number of laws that did not align with English laws. I remember that's one of the stipulations in the Connecticut Charter. The prime one that, that Connecticut was also guilty of was we did not allow the King's Anglican Church in Connecticut or Massachusetts. So that was one of the laws that he, they were definitely found guilty of. So, so he's going to take the throne and he owns everything up to the Connecticut River, he believes. And 100 miles on, he's got the Massachusetts Bay Colony without a charter. So we'll go to the next slide. And so his reign starts with a jolt, I say. He decrees that all the charters of all the colonies between New Jersey and Maine are null and void. He wants all the charters, seven colonies, and they will unite and be governed as one called the Dominion of New England. So here's a term that is um, a key to this presentation, the Dominion of New England. And so next slide. And so here's just a, a quickie map of, of that. Um, you know, it was officially established in May of 25 of 1686, and it consisted of up to the Connecticut colony. And you'll see some of these like Plymouth Plantation. I don't really know the difference between the colony of Rhode Island and the Providence Plantation, other than the colony of Rhode Island was primarily in, in uh, Newport. Uh, so um, next slide. And so who is going to be the new governor? And he's not going to be in New York this time. Um, Edmund Andros has pointed the governor of the Dominion. It's 10 years later, he was back in England. He has been knighted by James II, and he is now Sir Edmund Andros. Um, you remember he tried to connect, you know, claim control of the Western Connecticut. Um, so his first job is going to collect and destroy charters. Uh, next. So here is what the general court does. This is right out of the public records of the colony of New York, again, during the administration of yeah. Sir Edmund Andros. And it reads, this court grants the plantations of Hartford and Windsor, D not required, and those lands on the north of Woodbury and Mattituck. Mattituck is Waterbury. In fact, their historical society is in a building called the Mattituck. Um, and then it's the west of Farmington and Simsbury to the Massachusetts line and to run westward to the Housatonic or Stratford River. And that puts a clause in there we don't need, but to make a plantation or villages thereon. So it's granted for the purpose of developing into new towns. And you will see the next paragraph Grants, Wethersfield, Middletown, uh, Farmington, Wallingford, it, it keeps going on. It basically any known non-deeded land is committed to some town in the, the colony uh, of Connecticut as they existed in, um, you know, 1670s, 1680s. Uh, and in the the notes that went with this in the early part of this uh, book was vague language to keep things somewhat vague to avoid the usurpation of Sir 
Edmund Andros. I mean, they put it in print, but probably not publicly. Uh, so they didn't be any more specific than to say it grants the land there with the, for the purpose of building a plantation or a village. Uh, next slide. So here we are, here's 1687 and, the next, and this area is the whole Northwest corner. Also is called the uh, Manituck um, Preserve. Uh, it's pretty much home to uh, Native Americans. And at the time, the King Philip War had just ended 10 years prior and most of the Indians had been forced back into this corner of Connecticut. Um, um, the Western side of this is really uh, kind of under the jurisdiction of the Six Nations, the Iroquois Nations of New York. Uh, it, it really doesn't, the, the tribes before never really linked to the South uh, Eastern, you know, the Mohegans and the Nipmucks and the Quanics. So, so this, is, this is Indian territory. Uh, next. So the general court though of Connecticut is very slow to respond to Andros's demand. They're gonna go back and forth with correspondence. They're in that book, um, that, that the, the records there. And Andros is running out of patience. This has been going on for at least a year. And uh, next slide. Here's a quote of one of the letters that went back to uh, Boston and uh, from the general court. It uh, was written by the, uh, the general court secretary, John Allen. That's a very popular name in Windsor and Hartford, but it, it is, I love it. It says, it is thought not convenient yet. And they, that's the general assembly, and they will not be moved beyond their pace. Notwithstanding the advantages that offers to encourage a present union, they will not yet be persuaded to it. Well, that didn't go over very well. So Sir Andros decided there was only one thing left to do. And that would be, next slide. And he would come personally to collect the Royal Charter. And he arrived on October 31 of 1687. Remember this all started in May of, six, of 86. So we've been going on about 15, 16 months. So there in the room, there is the charter. There is uh, Robert Treat, the governor at the time. Um, but uh, when he clicks the next one, uh, pay attention to the men around the candle. Whoop. And next. <laughs> the lights go out. These guys are on to, we're up to something. And so next slide and voila, the charter is gone. But the official royal seal that would stamp all official documents is turned over. The general court is disbanded and the colony is officially now part of the dominion of New England. So we cease to be a colony. And uh, next slide. And so it's thought that uh, a, a Captain John Wadsworth is credited with hiding the charter in the hollow of an oak tree on nearby Willis Hill. Now this tree is getting older, this painting, that's I think at the Bushnell, um, next slide. Um, and you can see it at the Connecticut Historical Society that's off Asylum Avenue, I think, in, in uh, Hartford, a chess set made of the oak. And also, uh, next, and also there's a couple of oak chairs at the old state house in the center of Hartford um, and uh, that were made from the oak. But otherwise, it was a uh, the Charter Oak is gone. Uh, next. So the issue for James 
is um, the problem the next year. Um, one thing about that's unfortunate about the Stuarts of from uh, after the second half of the 1600s is their inability to have um, offspring to take on the royal duties of being king or queen. Um, so James has had two wives. There have been 18 pregnancies. Um, his first wife had out of uh, seven pregnancies, had two daughters, a uh, Mary and an Anne. The brother Charles had told them that they had to be raised Protestant. And so they pretty much were raised in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, they will come back to be Queens later on. But his second wife was uh, Mary of Madonna, uh, which is an Italian city, Italian family. And she is very Catholic. Uh, James himself is actually a closet Catholic at this time. And he has a son and his James. And James will grow up to be, uh, leave a full life. But the Protestant parliament, uh, oh, let me, let me stop here for a second. James actually, it was just today that I started doing background checks on James himself, was a very uh, uh, a number one kind of guy. He, he was attentive to his children, most um, royalty that other people raised the children. It was very, he was very active in the children's um, growth. Um, he um, he had he made a declaration. One of the reasons they would dismiss the, uh, the parliament was um, he he made a declaration of indulgences or of liberty of conscience, which would allow Catholics back to take uh, public jobs, public service jobs, and uh, the parliament didn't like it, so they would dismiss the parliament, and uh, he would dismiss the the parliament. He actually, in one speech. Uh, compared religious intolerance to racial intolerance. I mean, he was uh, way ahead of his time or the same issues existed in uh, England as many that exist today for us. And uh, so he eliminated uh, what was known as the Test Act um, to work for the government, which, which really barred the Catholics couldn't take, couldn't, couldn't actually uh, passed the text act. They had a, they had a, won't even go there. So it's strictly a religious thing. Uh, and so um, the Protestant parliament took a bold step. Uh, next. They invited William and Mary who were in Holland. Mary had married uh, William. He was king of uh, one section of the Netherlands. The Netherlands had a couple different, uh, a Catholic Netherlands, a Protestant Netherlands, and this was definitely from the Protestant side. And, um, and so they encouraged um, William especially to bring his army over and uh, the parliament would gather their militias and they would, uh, and they would make him king. Um, and, and so he brings his army over and uh, he's greatly outnumbered by James, but James decides not to fight. And he goes into exile with Louis XIV, invited him to go to Versailles and spend the rest of his life, I guess. I'm not sure what James did, but, um, and so William and Mary came to be the king and queen co-royalty co uh, because she was the heir uh, to, the, to the crown, but he was given equal, um, reign. And the parliament then passed an interfaith marriage act that the royalty must be Protestant and Catholics are excluded from all government jobs again. And the, the marriage act though uh, hasn't been relaxed until the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, there would be no Harry and um, wherever his wife is wedding if they hadn't have relaxed that, if they, uh, 
had to do it for uh, Charles to marry Carmilla. You know, it was uh, those those rules from uh, 1688 have been in force for a couple centuries now, four centuries. So, uh, next slide. So now it's 1689, and uh, you know, in the you know, William kind of likes every summer to go out on war, so he takes his army and he tried to get the Scots and the Irish into line. And I don't know that they didn't seem that interested in the colonies initially because the dominion was dissolved. Um, Sir Edmund Andros was arrested and jailed in Boston. After 10 months, he was put on a ship and sailed back to England. Um, he is not recognized in Connecticut's list of governors, but his portrait that we showed you is a portrait that comes from the, um, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the Connecticut State, uh, um, what's the legislature building anyway. And, uh, and so his photo is in the Hall of Governors, but he's not listed as a governor. And Robert Treat, they had never found a portrait of him to hang in the gallery. So it's from this period, uh, you go to the governor's gallery in the state house, you will not find uh, Robert Treat, but you will find um, Edmund Andros's uh, portrait. Uh, next. So I'm kind of at the end of my talk. Um, this is uh, the Western lands. They lie quiet for the next 30 years. Uh, one more. Um, and so all is well. Um, Hartford, Windsor, and the colony have concluded a difficult agreement. Um, all is well. And uh, Hartford and Windsor are now the proud owners of about 300,000 acres of land. And so next week, we'll talk about how speculators from Hartford Windsor's forced the General Assembly to reconsider that generous gift they had given. Uh, they were going to want it back. A compromise will be reached. Uh, and uh, and half the reserve will be divided into townships and then parceled out. So that's what we will be discussing uh, next week. What do we do now that we, now that we have this land? Um, next, uh, got one closing slide. Just special thanks to Doug and Michelle Tom, who helped me get my resources when I started this a couple of years ago. Um, I'd like to recognize Mark McCarran, Executive Director of Torrington Society. This is their their facility. It's uh, this house is a, like a uh, is a, a it's a museum closed during cult of uh, uh, covert problem, COVID problem. Uh, the one on the left, the greenish building, is actually there, like our uh, the history of Torrington. And the first room you go in is a room that's just dedicated to Windsor, since the Windsor people are going to basically, um, you know, have the first rights to Torrington land. And Paul Hart was vice president of the Bar Hampstead Society, and this is their. Um, so it's uh, Squire's Tavern, which is right across the street from the west uh, west branch of the Farmington River uh, and Bart Hampstead. So anyway, these are the people that helped me doing the research, and uh, I'd like to thank them. So my talk is over. Any questions? Al, thank you. You know, it's uh, fascinating as we listen to you to think about all the different ways uh, things could have gone awry. We often think about Connecticut as the way it is today, and it must have always been uh, planned to be this way. Uh, but, but as you've helped us see, uh, not so. It, it could have uh, could have come out in, in many, many different ways. I'd love to open it up for questions. If anybody has one or a comment, please uh, ra raise your hand. Um, you may have to turn your video back on so we can see you, um, but we'd uh, love to entertain any questions or thoughts you might have. And you can take this down, the slide down, I would say.
Easier to see the people. Yes. Thank there you. we go. All righty. I see Nat. It looks like you have your hand up, Nat. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. I need to keep my video off because I have um, bandwidth issues, but thank you very much. Um, I have a specific question. I'm really interested in the, um, the history of the land grants uh, made by the native peoples. And I was fascinated to see your slide um, on that original map of the first land grant. So I guess my question is, is two, two parts. Is one is, are the slides gonna be generally available to us? And second, um, with respect to that particular map, um, where might which, I- Which map was the one? That was the uh, early map you showed of the uh, land uh, from the native peoples. Um, the oldest one, <clears throat> the one I superimposed the red box on, Yes. Yes. I think I just got that on the internet. You know, if you put in, you know, uh, 1650 maps, you'll come up with a big variety of them. Um, I'm just trying to think uh, if you can get a, you know, I, I have all those, you know, a file on all the, the, the maps that I, that I've used. Um, so Sue, if you can get a, um, <clears throat> an email for her uh, and pass it to me, I can attach a map to it. Thank you very much. Al, thank you. Any other questions? Well, it's one of my college professors used to say, well, if there's no questions, it must have been perfect teaching. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt that. <laughs> no. Well, I thank you very much for, for part one tonight, Al. It, it's, uh, this is the stuff that we should have learned in school and, 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 and didn't. And uh, it's always fascinating. Um, not seeing any other questions, and, and if I'm missing one, please do wave your hand frantically. I'm just uh, I'm looking carefully and not seeing any. Uh, several nice comments in the uh, chat box. Thank you all for your, your feedback uh, to Al. And we'll be back again next week. So um, I wanted to say a couple of closing uh, comments as well. Of course, uh, in addition to thanking uh, Al so much for his research and his patience in putting all this together and laying it all out so clearly for us, uh, I want to thank Sue Tate Porcaro, who on my screen is right next to me in the pink sweater. Uh, she's been the one that's been uh, troubleshooting and making sure everybody gets into the uh, uh, program effectively and, and all of that. So thank you very much, Sue, for, for all of your help tonight. Um, please join us for part two, uh, which will be next Thursday at the same time. Um, and it is the same Zoom link as well. Uh, we'll also help, uh, hope you will help us spread the word uh, we have an exciting new genealogical program coming up in February. It's entitled Seek and Ye Shall Find African-American and Caribbean Genealogy. Uh, it's really the first of its kind that we've offered. Uh, and we're really excited to have Sandra Tate Eady, who is a renowned uh, genealogical researcher. Uh, this is a three-part virtual program. It'll be offered on the first three Saturday afternoons in February. So uh, please uh, look at our website if you'd like more information on that and, and do help us spread the word uh, to people that might be interested. Um, we're, we're always trying to find uh, new ways to serve uh, the audiences here in Windsor and our surrounding areas. So thank you all again for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you all again next week and hope you have a, a warm, safe and healthy week in between. Thanks everybody.